Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Geraldine, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator. I am the training coordinator here at Parent to Parent of Georgia, and I am very pleased that you've joined us today for our webinar, Transition to Adulthood. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them in the question box on your control panel. Feel free to type them as they come in your mind. We will address them at the end of today's presentation. Now that we have the housekeeping items out of the way, let me thank you once again for joining us for our webinar. And it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Satara Nayak, and she'll be your presenter for today. Thank you, Geraldyn. Hello, everybody. My name is Satara Nayak, and I work at Parent to Parent of Georgia. And I apologize if you can see the screen, but suddenly my cursor decided not to work. Um, so I'm trying to figure that out. Um, but anyway, today's um, presentation, as you know, is Transition to Adult Health Care. And what we'll be talking about today is um, just, we're just doing the bare, um, you know, just skimming through the surface um, of uh, transition to adulthood. Um, we're not, you know, we're not getting into lots of detail because this could be a full four hour um, seminar, uh, but we're trying to, you know, I'm just going to touch some details so that you can um, get some idea and some information about it um, and at least start the process if you've not yet started the process. Um, so hopefully my cursor is working. My uh, computer just froze and I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, I don't know why I had everything ready and going and now it's just, uh, there you go, okay. All right. Okay. So, so I just wanted to introduce myself, and uh, when I introduced, I said I worked at Parent to Parent of Georgia, and very briefly, a uh, little bit about what we do. Um, um, we are a nonprofit organization, and we help families uh, birth to 26 um, impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. Um, we provide lots of different services. Essentially, uh, in a nutshell, to tell you, we help families navigate the special education um, system, um, and that's what it refers to as a parent training information center. And then we also help families navigate the healthcare system, um, and that's the family to family health information center. Um, we also are um, central directory for Babies Can't Wait, which means that um, that 800 number that is out there for Babies Can't Wait is ours, and we help families connect to Babies Can't Wait. We also have a database of services, so if you're looking for therapists or looking for psychologists, psychiatrists, um, it's online. You can just click, go on our website and click on it. As you can see, there are whole other services that we provide. I'm not going to get into lots of detail, but um, feel free to go to our website and check us out. And this is also an easy way to reach us. Um, there is our 800 number as well as a 774 number, uh, 770 number. Um, so feel free to call us for more information um, or if you're looking for um, anything for your child. Right? All right. So to get into what we will learn today, um, basically we're going to talk about um, uh, what is transition to adult health care. Um, I'll explore a little bit about the roles of all the team members that are involved. Uh, we'll talk about a plan. Um, and then I'm also going to give you some concrete examples of what that plan might look for for different kids. Um, and we'll very briefly talk about health care financing. That is a whole new, I mean, could be a whole different training in itself. Um, and then just briefly about legal issues that are involved once your child is um, transitioning to adulthood. Um, so like I said before, we're just going to skim the surface of this training today. Um, this is just to give you um, like a start off, a you know, to start this process if you haven't started, if you have started, and many of you may not even know it that you've started it per se, you may not have called it transition to adult health care, but it might be something that you're already doing. Um, so, um, and uh, please feel free to um, type in your questions in the question box if you have any questions, um, and I might just pause uh, halfway through and ask Geraldine if there are any questions for me to answer, um, and then I would be more than happy to answer questions at the end too. Um, so um, please feel free to ask us. Um, you know, stop. Uh, type in your questions as you um, as they um, as they occur to you. All right, so we're going to talk about what is transition, health transition. Um, so the different types of transition to adulthood, I mean, we can kind of split it into different things. 
the first one is health education most of you will know you know are familiar with it as moving from high school to college or any kind of vocational training employment is basically moving from school to an employment uh, situation um, and then also the legal rights and responsibilities that come up with your child hitting the age of majority which is 18 and what um, rights and responsibilities come along with that and independent living is um, you know, um, maybe your child moves away and lives on their own. It could also be that your child might be moved, moving away and living with roommates or living with caregivers. So that process of independent living um, is also a big part of a transition to adulthood. So today we're going to focus only on a health transition. Um, and basically in, in like a two bullet point sentence, if you want to say what is health transition, it essentially means moving from pediatric um, healthcare to adult healthcare, and there are lots of changes that come up with this transitioning, and we'll talk about um, some of those and some of the steps that need to be taken in order to make this transition smooth for you and your child. Um, and it, it includes finding the right providers for your child as they move um, through uh, from pediatric to healthcare. It might be um, finding new health insurance once your child is aged out of the family plan, or um, if your child has Medicaid, then at 18, you know, you would have to apply for Medicaid all over again because adult Medicaid is a little different from Medicaid for children. Um, so th that's some of the things that, uh, and also moving from dependence on family to independence and how health plays a role in it. Um, so what does health have to do with transition? And it says in here in bold, everything. So just to give you an example, um, so just say Joe is 19 and he wants to become a chef. So he's training, that's what he's training to do. Uh, he's also diagnosed with a severe seizure disorder and his health depends on um, you know, how well he remembers to take his medication and follow his doctor's advice about getting enough rest. So if Joe forgets to take his medication, it could definitely jeopardize his goals for learning, working, living safely and independently in the community, which means basically it affects everything. So it's important that you know, there's a plan in place um, to get Joe to where he remembers to take his medication or is reminded to take his medication, and all this could be part of the transition process. And I'll give you some you know, concrete examples as we go through. Um, and this plan, having a plan, um, you know, will help prioritize what needs to be done immediately, like what is it that Joe can do right now, what does he need help with, and it also has a timeline that will help things like a checkoff list or to-do list. Um, and then, so again, about having a plan, you think about Joe's example, at 19 he might still be seeing his pediatric neurologist who is uh, helping him manage his seizures, but when he turns 21, um, he might not be able to see that pediatric neurologist. And at this time, he might already be you know, going to trade school, learning to be a chef, and he might forget the fact that, oh my god, I don't have a doctor anymore, and suddenly he turns 21 and the doctor says, I can't see you. Well, he doesn't have his prescription, he doesn't have his medications, and this could jeopardize everything for him. Um, so, you know, as you can see, um, not addressing health transition, um, it you know becomes it, 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 it's very critical that we address it because not addressing it affects every aspect of our life. And we all know, I mean, if we don't feel healthy, if we don't feel good, we're not going to work to our best potential. And this is for everybody, whether you have a special health care need or not, um, and especially for our kids who do have um, you know health issues. Um, so this is a you know, that's why it's really important to think about this. Um, so what is a health transition plan? Um, so most of you might be very familiar with, um, you know, the transition plan that is part of your child's IEP, which is the Individualized Education Plan. Um, so I just want to point out some differences between the IEP transition plan and the health transition plan. So one of the big things about the health transition plan that you have to remember is that it's not mandatory. Like for Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it mandates, the law mandates that every child with an individualized education plan must have an educational transition plan. So the transition plan only addresses the education piece, I'm sorry about that, the, um, you know, it only addresses the education piece, it does not address um, the health piece at all. Um, so it's not mandated. 
a health, so that's why it's important to have a health transition plan, and a health transition plan is not mandatory. Um, so then the onus of it to put a plan together kind of falls on the parent or the caregiver, um, because, um, you know, who else is going to put a plan together? Um, and then the other part of it also is just because you're the parent and caregiver doesn't mean you can do everything on the plan. You need to have team members. Just like an IEP, you need to have team members. But unlike an IEP, um, you know, where you all sit together around a table and a decision is made with your child there, with a health transition plan, the members of the team might be scattered and you, it's almost impossible to get everybody to come together. I mean, you can't really, if you're having a conversation with your doctor, which is great, you're having it in the doctor's office, and then, you know, you want to have a conversation with the school, so trying to get school personnel to come to the doctor's office could be an impossible task. So not every in one place, but that doesn't mean that you can't get everybody on the same page. Um, so, you know, or connecting your current pediatrician to your future doctor that your child might see, you know, ability of both of them meeting physically in one place is almost impossible. So um, keep, you know, those are some of the things that are different. Um, and then the other thing also is, you know, we know that the individualized education plan has, you know, there is a mandatory a requirement of how an IEP should look, um, how it should be drafted, who should be there, how it should be, you know, all those kind of rules are there. Whereas a health plan, it's, it, it's different. I mean, you know, every person's health plan can look completely different from the next person and can be only for certain sections that they need assistance with and need not address other things. So not every, everybody does not have to have everything in their health plan. Um, so, um, you know, I would, I would definitely urge, you know, to start thinking about a transition health plan when your child is like 14, when they start having their transition health plan, transition plan at school is a good time to also think about the health piece of it. All right, so who makes up the team for your transition plan? So as you see, um, the most important person of the transition plan is your um, child, your young adult. So that's why we have youth in the middle. And then you have all these other people around them who need to, who are part of the team. Um, so you have, you know, um, educators, your child's current pediatrician. Um, once your child moves out, you know, they might see a primary care doctor, then there are certain adult providers. And you, of course, as a parent or a caregiver, is pivotal to this team. Um, so I'm just going to move forward and show you what role each one of them plays, and everybody has a role in this. So I just wanted to show you, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll explore each one's roles. But before that, I wanted to show you a sample health transition plan. And this is actually something that you do even before you have maybe a plan. Um, this kind of like it says, you know, checkbox. I understand my youth's medical condition. I have planned for my youth's adult specialty care, vision care, you know, it gives you an idea. So it's kind of like a checklist to say, okay, where do I start with this? You know, what do I do? This is so, this is overwhelming. I have too much to think about. So this checklist is, uh, is a, you know, an easy way to um, look at things and organize your thoughts and have like a checkbox. Of, and then it also helps you prioritize. Okay, what is it that I need to do first? You know, what is it that we need to focus right now? Um, what is it that I can focus later? So it allows you to have a timeline and prioritize your things. So this is just one example. There's a website called uh, Go Transition, and um, you know that's that's a pretty good site to go to. There are some other transition sites, or just call us, and we might be able to, um, you know, we'll definitely be able to send you um, the sample transition health plan. Um, you know, um, if you're looking for it and you want, you know, you want something. Um, that you can help check off. Um, so we can definitely send that to you too. And I'll, you know, my, my email information is at the end of this presentation, or like I said, just call us at that 800 number, uh, and we should be able to um, provide you with something like this. All right, so let's look at um, what, um, what each team, so as, as a young person, you know, their um, role, they are very pivotal, like I mentioned, to this um, plan because it's about them, it's for them. Um, but 
so you know start teaching them self advocacy skills self management skills so what does it mean to be a self advocate so basically a self advocate is someone who is good at letting others know what he or she is thinking so you know so basically you know feeling so if your child goes to the doctor you know giving them the opportunity to speak there to tell them what works for them what doesn't work for them um, you know might be a good idea um, sometimes self-advocacy means asking a lot of questions so if the doctor is saying I'm gonna put you on this particular um, you know medical regimen um, you know if your child has questions that might be a good time to ask or even before they go in for the meeting you know you can ask your child maybe jot down some of the questions that you would have for the doctor um, you know what is it that um, you would um, uh, you know you would want to ask them and as a parent we have questions for doctors but um, our child as, as a young person you know they might have completely different uh, questions because they're um, point of view is different. Um, you know, it might have to do with socialization. It might have to do with, you know, if the doctor is saying you need to wear an eye patch um, and walk around campus, you know, and that they may not want to do that. That might be embarrassing to them. So, you know, what are the alternatives? Can we look for alternatives? Is there instead of an eye patch, is there something else? Can we get glasses that look cool? You know, I'm just throwing out ideas and suggestions here, but, you know, those kind of things. So it's important that your child be given the opportunity to ask questions. Um, sometimes being a self-advocate um, means helping others understand, um, you know, why, um, why something is important to you. Um, and sometimes it means asking for help. Um, so those are all, you know, some of the things um, that can mean a, when we talk about self-advocacy could be all those things. Um, and when we talk about managing your own health, um, so basically, you know, we want your child should be able to understand their own condition. So let's take the same Joe's example of Joe. Um, you know, at 19, when Joe was younger, um, you know, his parents gave him books on um, seizure disorders, um, and his parents helped him select the book, engaged him in numerous discussions, talked about his special health care need. Um, he was included in decisions about treatment options by his parents and um, doctors so that he could understand better. So at 19, he kind of knew, okay, you know, I can recognize my symptoms, I know when I'm going to get a seizure or, you know, I know I need to tell people who are around me what they need to do if I have a, um, you know, have an episode. So uh, understanding your medical condition is an important part of it. Um, and the other thing is your teen should be able to explain their condition. So, um, so for example, Samantha is able to tell people, I have cerebral palsy, I can use a wheelchair that I can operate by controlling with a touchpad with my head, you know, I need help with many daily activities, but I can make my own decision and direct my care. Um, so, you know, think about what is it that your child can do and work on those things as, um, you know, um, as positives and how can you enhance their role in, take, in them taking part in their own care. Um, for example, you know, being able to monitor their own health. So, for example, you know, Trevor knows the signs and symptoms um, when he needs his inhaler for asthma. He knows the pollen count is really high. You know, I know I'm going to have an asthma attack. Um, I know, you know, I start feeling, um, you know, a little bit out of breath. I know that's my first symptom. So, um, you know, I'm going to take my inhaler with me, make sure I have it in my bag, or, you know, I may not be running today just because a pollen count is high and that will trigger an asthma attack. So knowing those things are important. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, are doing this with your kids as they're young and, you know, and it's become a part of their life. Um, and then um, having an emergency plan is very important, especially when our kids transition. And even otherwise, I mean, our kids are, you know, you're not always going to be with their, physically with your child. So having an emergency plan, who to contact, name of the hospital, name of doctor, what medication uh, your child takes, all those things, you know, putting an emergency plan is also important. Um, so that's what a youth, um, you know, some of the things that a young person needs to do. So what is, what is your role as a parent? So sometimes some of these things can be really hard. So some, sometimes you as a parent have to act as a coach. Think of yourself as a coach. So you're on the sidelines. You know, your child is the one who's experiencing it, who's doing it. Um, but uh, you're on the sidelines providing that guidance and that, and that um, support to them. Well, some kids might need more than 
you being on the guide uh, on the sidelines. You know, they might so in that position you might be the act as a spokesperson for your child. So, um, you know, let's first talk about being a coach. So, being a coach is like simple things like it sounds very simple. Like, who schedules appointments? Um, for your doctor's appointments. You know, as mom or dad, this is easy to do. We just take out a calendar and we just call the doctor's appointment, make the next appointment. Maybe next time ask your child to make that appointment. Um, and then, you know, work with them to see, okay, what all do you need to make that appointment? Do you need your insurance card? Do you need your calendar? Um, do you want to make sure that your mom or dad is there available to drive you to school or drive you to the appointment um, if, if you can't drive yourself? Um, and then it also might be like, okay, I need to take time off from school, so, you know, do I have any important assignments that are there that I'll be missing? So some things, all the things that your child needs to consider while scheduling an appointment. So help do this with them. Uh, it could also be um, medication management. You know, when do I need to call for a prescription? Oh my God, I'm you know I'm on my last tablet today, and um, you know I haven't called for a prescription. So the next time, you know, instead of you as a parent doing it, uh, give the write out four or five steps for your child, teach them the way that they would learn best, um, and um, coach them, walk them through the process. Um, so these are some of the things that you know definitely you can sit on sidelines and do. So let's give, get some examples of um, parent as a spokesperson. So, you know, although your child may not be able to actively self-advocate and, you know, manage their healthcare needs, uh, maybe they're more involved and they can't do those things. Um, so then I would suggest make a list of things my child can do independently or can do with some support or things my child can communicate, you know, whether it's verbal or non verbal verbal, uh, think of things uh, my child um, can learn to do, you know, so those are some of the things um, to think about. Um, so for example, just to give you an example, so if your child can count, um, then maybe, um, you know, your child's health transition plan should include a goal where your child will learn to count the amount of medication he or she needs, and then maybe um, organize it in a pill sorter. You know, so, um, or if your um, child is, um, you know, not um, verbal but is a but is a visual learner, um, then you can put a picture schedule up and ask them to, you know, point to the pictures and make a goal of, um, you know, um, uh, of using the pictures in order to remind, um, you know, remind them about doing something. So those are some of the things that you can do. So think of ways, think of what your child can do, and then um, build on those things. So because all we want all kids, um, you know, how are their ability, uh, whatever be their ability, we want all kids to be able to participate in their healthcare. Um, so let's move on to. Um, what role does um, you know your doctor play? Um, so basically, your primary care doctor, your pediatrician, you know they're crucial. Um, you know, so you would um, you know sometimes they may not be able to see your child anymore after they turn 21 or 18. Uh, it might be because we know that sometimes treating adults with the same condition is a very different approach than treating a child with the same condition. Um, so maybe have this conversation with your doctor, you know, what is the age of transition, you know, till what age will you be able to take care of my child? You know, would you be able to find new doctors? Can you provide me with a list of potential new doctors? Um, you know, can you draw up a health summary so I, when I go to the new doctor, I can um, provide that to them? You know, so those are some things that you definitely have to have this conversation with your doctor. And I would say starting, you know, 14, asking your doctor at that point so at least you know what's coming up would be good. If your child is already 14 or already 18, it's never too late. You know, if you haven't asked this question to your doctor, then you need to ask it now. All right, so we talked about health transition versus IEP transition and how uh, health transition is not mandatory. Um, you know, there's no laws that say that you have to have a health transition plan, but could always embed the health goals that your child has into your child's IEP because um, you know their transition um, is about everything. It's transition, you know, it's it's an educational transition, but also um, teaching them certain skills can be definitely part of that educational transition. Um, so I'll um, you know I'll give you some 
examples of how this would look um, you know in your child's IEP okay so let's look at this one so the goal is Leah will learn the phone number and how to call in her own prescription refill three out of four times okay so the accommodation will be that Leah will use picture boards that help her sequence the steps in order to order her prescription. So what does she need first? Like she needs to have her insurance card. She needs to have the phone number for the pharmacy. Um, you know, she needs to have um, the name of the medication. Um, you know, all those things listed out there. And who helps her? Maybe the speech therapist will work with Leah to develop a picture board. Um, the school nurse will, you know, work with the speech therapist to see, you know, to talk about it. So that, so this could be a goal that she she learned the phone number this, um, so that she can call her own prescription. You can break this down. It could just be that she learns how to call in a prescription, you know, how to dial the phone. So it's it, it looks pretty simple, but this is something that you can definitely incorporate into your child's IEP. Um, let's look at one more example. Okay, so Monica will be knowledgeable about the process of, to obtain power of attorney for healthcare to enable her and her family to manage her illness. Um, so maybe Monica goes and connects with the school social worker and with support from the school nurse um, and, um, and special education teacher, you know, they will assist her in getting some legal information that she needs, um, you know, and to see how that process goes on. So these are just some, you know, and Monica's diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, you know, she recognizes her illness and she recognizes the, the impact of her illness on her ability to manage her medication. So, you know, um, so she wants to learn how her parents can remain involved in helping her um, make healthcare decisions even after she turns 18. So that's kind of the background of this one. So just, you know, these are just some examples. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can incorporate. Um, you know, your child's um, health transitions into your child's IEP. Okay, so ne next let's talk about uh, what are the roles of the adult um, providers. So um, we talked about your child's pediatrician in the transition process, um, you know, and uh, you know, based on the recommendations of a child's pediatrician or other sources, you know, you would have to start looking and finding adult healthcare providers, um, you know, or family practitioners for your child. So just to give you some differences, um, you know, typically in a pediatric um, um, care or adolescent care, uh, you know, they are they actively involve the parent and other family members, but in adult care, typically that's not the case, you know. So they tend to focus only on the patient um, and they assume that the patient can manage their health care independently. So, um, you know, if that's not the situation with your young adult, then you need to be aware and you need to inform them and be a part of their um, uh, meeting with their health care provider. Um, you know, it's also important that, you know, the tone of the appointment might be different and one is very informal. I mean, we all know, you know, we have, many of us have really good rapports with our um, pediatrician or adult uh, or other um, child care providers, um, you know, whereas in the adult care system it might be much more formal. Um, also your child's pediatrician, uh, you know, they might be more flexible. We know we've called in for that sick um, you know, schedules like, oh, my child is sick, can I bring them right now? And, you know, many times pediatricians will be like, sure, you know, we have, um, you know, we have time for that, bring them in. But that may not be the case with adult providers. So, you know, keep all those things in mind. Just there's this shift in kind of a culture with the child um, pediatric providers and the adult providers. Um, and then um, also remember that, um, you know, if your child is turning 18 or older, that um, your child is illegally an adult. Um, so, you know, there are some legal ramifications uh, when they turn 18. Um, so just to give you an example, um, Sophia is 19 years old. She's diagnosed with ADHD and diabetes. Um, at age 19, Sophia is, le is legally an adult and has a right to make her own decisions. If Sophia decides that she doesn't want her uh, mom in the examining room, um, then the doctor cannot share that information with her mom. You know, unless her mom has a written document from her that explicitly states um, her right to be in the room and to make healthcare decisions for her daughter. So that's some things to keep in mind um, as you make this transition. Um, 
So b before we look at some of the examples of how healthcare transition looks um, for different adults, um, I just want to check in with Gerilyn to see if there are any questions so far. Um, not yet. I don't see any. Um, does, does any of the do you all have any questions at this point? There are none in there. Oh. Okay. All yeah. right. We'll just uh, no problem. We'll just move forward. I just wanted to give the opportunity. You can always ask questions at the end too so um, just all right let me just uh, I'm just going to move forward to the next slides so how will health transition look for youth so this is just to give you some examples of what is it that it looks like um, you know so um, for like I said before transition plan can look very different depending on the type and the scope of the health issues that your child has um, so, for instance, um, a child who has a um, chronic medical condition, for example, um, cystic fibrosis. You know, some of you might know that a child with cystic fibrosis, they typically see a whole host of doctors. So the first step might be to see, you know, can you find an adult cystic fibrosis center, you know, some group, a group practice or a center that provides comprehensive support for an individual who has cystic fibrosis. Um, you know, then you can talk to the pediatric team that you currently have and they should start outlining a timetable for transition. You know, so it could be like information about the adult center should be available, you know, should be provided by the pediatric service. The pediatric team should prepare a transition document which basically can give, you know, like a health summary, what's going on, what medications you're taking, um, you know, what are the latest lab reports, uh, all that important information that you would need um, so they can prepare a summary and we all know I mean some of us have kids you know our kids medical files are like dictionaries they're so big and so if you take that amount of documents and go to the new doctor and put it on your table you know for sure they're not going to go through that entire document because we have things right from birth to you know if your child is 18 birth to 18 you can imagine how much paperwork you would have um, so instead of that is there a one page summary or a couple page summary that the pediatric team can prepare um, for a transition document and I do this you know even for even if I'm going to see a new doctor even right now like if I'm going to see a new doctor I will um, my son has uh, you know special health care needs what I do is if I'm going to see a new doctor I put like a one pager on all the important things related to that condition that I'm going to see that doctor for and so when I walk into the doctor's office I hand out this one pager to them and it's really easy for them to read get an idea of where we are um, and then move forward from there instead of them trying to read through you know volumes of medical information that that my ch my son has right from birth to now um, so that's, you know, having a transition document, a uh, similar transition document might be um, really helpful. And then also you want your young person to start spending time with their um, pediatric um, cystic fibrosis doctors, you know, so they can learn what medications they're taking. Um, you know, and your child knows, you know, they can tell you whether they're verbal or they do not have words to communicate, they use other means to communicate, they can tell you, you know, when they're feeling good or not feeling good or something is hurting or that medication is not, you know, doesn't work for me, that antibiotic doesn't work for me. So, you know, asking those questions and making sure that their input is also there in that transition document is very important. Um, and then one of the things, you know, in this example of cystic fibrosis, medical concerns for adults with cystic fibrosis is very different from those with children, um, you know, with, I mean, who have um, cystic fibrosis. So, you know, thinking of those things is important. Um, all right. So, just to give you another example, um, so this is if a child is diagnosed with a mental health related, um, you know, issue. Um, so one of the goals in the transition plan can include maybe setting up a circle of support. Maybe your, um, you know, your uh, young adult is going to going off to college. You know, till now you've been this their circle of support, and any time they've been in. A, place where they don't feel good about themselves or they're having something going on or time of crisis they know that they can you know call you and talk to you well they might be going to college that is four hours away 
Um, or they might be calling, they might be going to college that is um, one hour away and you're not immediately accessible. So building a circle of support, or you, or you as a parent might be on talking on the phone to somebody else or might be tied up with something else and you may not get that call. So um, having a circle of support that they can rely on is important, might be important. Um, and so, you know, um, making sure that you start building the circle for them and then they help that they have that circle that'd be good. So for example, your child, you know, like I mentioned the example of going to college, you know, it might be that they um, talk to the Office of Student Support Services in their, um, or they might talk to the, um, you know, if there's a psychologist and staff, they might talk to the psychologist. Um, they might talk to other people that your child is very comfortable talking to. So, you know, making sure that that circle of support exists might be important. Um, so another example is if your child is diagnosed with a, a developmental disability, say such as Down syndrome, you know, um, then your plan should include finding adult primary care doctors who are familiar with treating adults with Down syndrome, because we know that some health issues that your child may face um, as an adult might be very unique and different. Um, uh, and might be very specific to that syndrome. Um, for example, your plan might include notes to monitor tendency towards obesity or testing for sleep apnea or testing for thyroid disease. You know, these are some of the things that, um, you know, are some of the issues that are seen with adults with um, Down syndrome. So having a doctor who's knowledgeable about the syndrome might be important um, so that they they are able to, you know, do preventive treatments uh, and not wait for things to happen. So that's kind of, you know, how some of the health transitions might look for youth, um, you know, different um, kids with different types of um, health, uh, health, special health care needs. Um, so, like I said, you know, everybody's health plan looks different, um, just like an IEP, but even more so than an IEP because it depends on what does your child need, what what are the what does your family need to make this transition smooth. So the next big topic um, is um, healthcare financing, and I'm not really going to touch into this. I mean, these are all independently. They are each one of these are like a two-hour to four-hour workshop that I can spend time on, but I'm just going to touch on this. So. Um, you know, many of you um, might be aware the the Affordable Care Act. If you are part of the, you know, if you have that, you you've got it through the marketplace. Then uh, most most often you can have your child's a child on your private health healthcare insurance till they turn 26. Um, you know, so if your child has private, if your child is on your health insurance, then they can stay on till they're 26. Medicaid. Um, Medicaid changes, um, you know, once your child turns 18, if they've had Medicaid before, um, whatever type of Medicaid they've had, um, if they've had SSI and had Medicaid, or they've had the Katie Beckett deeming waiver and had Medicaid, um, all those types of Medicaid will change because the way Medicaid looks as a child is very different from the way they look at, for eligibility purposes, I mean, the way they look at an adult. Um, so to just give you an example for um, if once your child turns 18 and say they did have SSI Medicaid before that, um, under 18 Medicaid takes into consideration, um, you know, your family's income. They take everybody's income into consideration who is living in that household. But once your child turns at 18, your child is considered an adult. Once your child turns 18, then only their income and asset is taken into consideration. And many of us um, you know, for many of us, our kids don't have bank accounts, they don't have, you know, so they might qualify, they'll qualify for it. So if your child hasn't qualified for Medicaid before uh, because of income, they might qualify at the age of 18. So um, make sure that, you know, that you're applying, that you're checking into it, and you can always call us um, as a resource. Um, you know, we can definitely walk you through that process and give you more information about it. Um, and if your child has a Katie Beckett deeming waiver, then you also have to look into that because um, that's only meant for children and um, they will lose that eligibility uh, once they turn adults, like, you know, once they turn 19. So uh, you might have to apply for Medicaid um, for them as an adult. Um, so there, uh, you know, and Peach Care for Kids is also for kids under the age of 18. 
Um, so you would have to, you know, if your child is on that, then you have to think about that. And then there, Medicare, which is typically for um, older uh, adults, 65 and older, but there is, there, you know, there, like I said, Medicaid is such a Medicaid and Medicare is so complicated. You can have, you know, there, there are instances when you can have Medicaid and Medicare. Um, so, you know, um, those are some of the things that you definitely, healthcare financing is like a, big piece of health, of transition. So definitely include this as part of your transition plan, you know, when you need to start checking, when you need to apply for SSI, um, you know, if that's what your child will qualify for, um, you know, what are the options, who you need to con connect with, how can you make this transition smooth so your child doesn't lose Medicaid um, coverage, um, you know, that you've not scheduled a surgery right at that transition point, if it's an, um, you know, um, elective surgery that you're not, it's not positioned at that point when your child is actually transitioning, you know, that kind of stuff. So think, keep those in mind, make a list, um, you know, of priorities, um, and this is all part of the transition plan. And like I said in the beginning, you know, transition is not an event, it's not something that you do one day and it happens, it's a process, and it's an ongoing long process. So, you know, it's a matter of having a plan, putting a timeline, and then start checking those boxes as you go through them. So legal issues, again, this is a whole, um, you know, two-hour workshop in itself. Um, but I'll just touch on um, some of the things that you might come across. So, um, you know, let's just take, let's say, Monica's example that we had used. You know, she's able to understand um, and process information regarding her health. Um, you know, she's able to, um, you know, uh, manage her health pretty much. But sometimes, um, you know, because of her bipolar, sometimes she's not always able to make sound and informed decisions about her own health. So in such in such a case, you know, all Monica might need is some informal supports. Um, and what is the informal support? It can involve like um, you know family and friends who are there to help guide her. Um, you know, it can be that she um, signs off a release of information form at the doctor's office, so other family members have access to her medical information. It could be that she um, puts in you know a written release, uh, giving uh, consent to uh, her doctors to talk to her parents or talk to other family members. Um, so it could be something like that, you know, so that those are, and she may need only, that, that's the amount of assistance that she may need. On the other hand, to give you an example, Mike is 21 years old, he's diagnosed with autism. Um, Mike is, um, communicates, does not communicate verbally, um, and, um, you know, and although he can indicate his feelings of discomfort, if he's not feeling well, he doesn't, understand his seizure disorder, and um, although he helps with putting pills in the pill solder, he cannot really read the labels, um, nor can he identify the different medications he takes. Um, in such a case, um, you know, Mike's parents might choose to have normal setup. They might decide either to do full guardianship, or they might decide to have a healthcare power of attorney. Um, you know, so they might, there There are lots of different options in formal supports. Full guardianship is not the only option available. Um, so definitely you would want to consult an attorney. You want this to be done um, that it adheres to all the local laws. Um, some of these change when you move from state to state. Um, they change and you have to make sure that whatever statement, whatever documents you've prepared works with that state law. So. Um, you know, there are various types of formal supports, um, and it's it's pretty can get pretty complicated. So I think for your transition plan, at least at this point, what you need to do in there is like maybe if your child is not yet 18, maybe put a check note there like, oh, I need to think about this before my child turns 18. Um, you know, so that, that could be the only takeaway that you get, then that's great. Um, or if your child is already 18 or 19, then maybe look into seeing, okay, how, you know, what are my next steps? How do I get um, get a power of attorney? What do I need to do? Um, you know, so um, start moving in that direction. Um, all right. I know I have really speeded through this and rushed through this process, but I wanted to just give you at least a brief outline of what um, what is a health transition plan, what it can include, just give you some ideas, some things to get you 
thinking if you've not yet started one. Uh, if And many of you may not be consciously thinking that this is a transition plan, but you're already doing this um, in different ways. But this gives you a much more defined purpose, a defined, a structured way of doing it. Um, and, um, you know, and we have other workshops that are longer that talk about in depth about um, transitioning to adult healthcare. Um, so, you know, just to give you a brief summary, you know, so a transition plan, you know, should include medical history, um, like the one pagers that I was suggesting it doesn't have to be a one page, but you know, um, a summary of your child's um, medical history would be really good, um, rather than giving like volumes of information to um, to the new provider that you're seeing. Um, you know, definitely having a list of current medications, um, and also keeping in mind inform in insurance information. Is my insurance changing? Can my child continue to be on my insurance? You know, do I need to apply for Medicaid? Um, and then uh, definitely including goals about self-management and self-advocacy. You know, we sometimes tend to focus on, oh my God, I'm waiting for that. I hope my child gets into this college. You know, we, he's worked really hard to get these grades in order to graduate and I just hope that they get in there. Well, you've thought about all that, but maybe your child has diabetes and they take medication and they're so used to you reminding them about taking their medication or how much medication they take or you calling in for their prescription. Well, they're going to college four hours away, you know, um, I mean, you can definitely call them, but are they going to, without several reminders, are they going to take it themselves, you know, are they not? Uh, and so working on these goals before, if your child is already away from your house, um, then don't think it's too late. I mean, it's, you can always put another plan in place, um, you know, to help them manage their um, health care. Um, and also self-advocacy, you know, it's a great tool. You know, having your child participate in their IEPs is like the first tool towards uh, advocacy. And you can start having this at 14. If they're 18 and they're school in, still in school, you know, it's not too late. You know, getting them to participate and learning those skills to um, talk at meetings, you know, talk to adults, um, and voice their concerns, um, you know, is, is really important. Um, and then, of course, keeping in mind legal issues when they turn 18, um, and also, you know, what kind of, um, you know, do you need um, uh, informal supports? Do you just need a release of information? Do you need full guardianship? Do you need a power of attorney for health care? You know, what is it that you would, that your child would need? Um, that would be important. Um, and of course, most importantly, finding adult providers. And this is hard, this is hard because there are not that many adult providers or there are complications. You can find an adult provider, but they may not take Medicaid. So this is a hard thing to do, um, but at least planning for it would be important. And at least knowing, you know, your child turns 21 and they don't have medications for the next month because your um, primary care, your pediatrician will not prescribe anymore. That's a bad situation to be in. But if you've thought about this, um, then you could discuss it with your uh, pediatrician to make sure that there is a plan in place. Um, you know, is there some, uh, you know, even if there's no adult provider uh, in, my, um, in my town, you know, do I have to travel up to Atlanta to get it? You know, what do I have to do? So those are some of the things to keep in mind as you, um, you know, find adult providers. And a timeline. A timeline is great because it keeps you on task. It, tells you when, you know, it gives you like, okay, I need to do this at this time, um, and then I need to check off my list. Um, so, you know, those are just some brief tips and suggestions, um, and what sh you should include in your health plan, uh, health transition plan. Um, you know, those are, like I said, it's just touching, you know, the basics of it. So, um, and let and I want to reiterate that, you know, we don't think about it, but it's really important. You know, if your child is not well, then how are they going to um, do anything that they were supposed to do? If they're not well, how can they go to classes? If they're not feeling well, um, you know, if they're going for vocational training, how can they go for that vocational training? Um, you know, health affects every part of our life. Uh, and so um, not addressing that um, is, you know, you're doing a disservice by not addressing that because that is going, it's going to, you know, not consciously working on it um, 
it will definitely have some you know impact later on so making sure that we have a plan and that we have things and get everybody on board you know talk to your doctor you don't have to do it yourself um, get ideas from your doctor get ideas from your school um, you know um, we can give you some um, ideas and you know um, there I think on our website there is a whole uh, webinar on embedding um, health goals into your child's IEP. You know, if you need, how how can I do that? How do I say that? You know, I know what I want happen, but I don't know how to write it into a goal. You know, those kind of things, you can definitely look up some information or call us and we can get you that information. Um, so, um, just wanted to, um, you know, emphasize the importance of health transition um, in your child's life. All right, and we're about 10 minutes. We have about 10 minutes if anybody has questions. So again, um, you know, that's the phone number. You can call here. Um, when you call this number, the 770 or the 800 number, um, you know, our staff should be able to help you. You can, or you can also email me, um, you know, so if you need any other information, uh, we'd be more than happy to provide that to you and help you walk through the process. Um, so Tara, Geraldine, we do have, any questions? yes, we do have two um, questions. One is from Dora. She wanted to know, can she get a copy okay. of this PowerPoint presentation? Um, I have to check on that. I'm not sure. Um, but um, what I can do is instead of giving you a copy of this, we have handouts that go out with one of the presentations that we make very similar to this. I can definitely send you all the handouts. That should pretty much cover a lot of the things that we talked to you about in this presentation. So, um, um, Dora, if you don't mind, uh, you know, my email address is right there, star at p2pga.org. Um, if you want to just um, shoot me an email, then I can absolutely send you the handouts. Um, the handouts cover a lot of stuff, so I can definitely send you that information. Um, you know, and I can also, I think I have to look up on our website, but um, if you're looking for health goals, you know, I can also send you that. Um, definitely send you those. All right, and I have Tamika. She has two questions. She wants to know, um, okay. she said first she missed the information about Katie Beckett. So she wanted to know, does okay. this apply to kids over the age of 18, and how will she apply for her daughter who's okay. 19 and will be 20 in May? That's our first question. All right. Okay, so Katie Beckett, um, basically what Katie Beckett is, it's um, in a really you know, nutshell to say, Katie Beckett is a type of Medicaid. It's just it's it's Medicaid, but but it's uh, for kids under the age of 19. So if your daughter is 20, then that's something that she cannot apply for. Um, it's it's just a way for children under the age of 18 to access Medicaid when their family's income is more than the Medicaid limit. But if your child is already 19 or 20, then they cannot apply. They are no longer qualified to apply for Katie Beckett. Um, you would have to apply for SSI. Um, for your child, and again, remember that your um, once your child is 19 or 20, um, only your child's income and assets will be taken into consideration, and then their disability will be taken into consideration. Um, so they look at it, you know, Medicaid, SSI, Social Security looks at it a little differently. Um, so you would have to apply for Medicaid for your child, um, and. Um, you know, I I don't want to go into waivers and things like that because I don't know all the, I don't know a lot of information. Um, I don't have a lot of information about your child, about your daughter. Um, but feel free to you know call us and we might be able to provide you with more detailed information. And Katie Beckett is for kids under the age of 19. Okay. So and her second question. question is: Do you strongly advise getting legal guardianship once a child turns 18? Her daughter will require supervision will always require supervision and will be with her for the rest of her life. Should she get guardianship? Okay, so like I said, I'm not a lawyer, so I am I can't, you know, I would definitely refrain from telling somebody, yes, you should do this or no, you shouldn't do it. But I want, uh, you know, before anybody gets full guardianship, you need to explore all your options because full guardianship is is serious. I mean, and for some of our kids, they need that. So I'm not saying that we don't need it. Now, some of our kids do need that full guardianship, but full guardianship is, is really serious. I mean, you're um, inadvertently, we're kind of stripping the rights of our child when we take full guardianship because they don't have, they cannot make, um, 
decisions about anything uh, in their life, um, you know, and and I don't I don't think they can vote either, you know. So there are lots of these things that um, are taken away when you get full guardianship, and one of the processes of full guardianship is you have to go to the court to to show that. Uh, the individual is not competent, um, so you're you're declaring incompetency. Which again, I want to emphasize that lots of our kids, this this you know this is the option for them. But for many of our kids, it may not be the option either. Um, I would definitely strongly suggest that you talk to an attorney, um, and we can also send you information about. Um, Full guardianship and other options of guardianship, because really explore those options uh, before you consider full guardianship. Um, you know, it's not the only choice. I, what I want, what I want families to have is choices and options, and make an informed decision based on those choices that are available. And you have to make the best decision that is best for your family, for your daughter. Um, so, you know, I would definitely refrain from giving you a categorical answer of yes, you should get guardianship or no. Um, but definitely need to explore um, those options for them, um, you know, so. Okay, and Any Susan, uh -huh, I have a couple of more. Susan's um, question is, will you be having a webinar on guardianship? Um, yes, we actually have a um, guardianship. I think we have one coming up um, pretty soon. Um, so, you know, keep, um, you know, if you're not, if you found out found found out about our webinars um, not directly from us, and you're wanting to be on our, um, you know, um, newsletter or uh, get information about us, just uh, you know, um, send us an email, and we can sign you up for our newsletters, or you know, um, we post on Facebook and things like that. We have a lot of uh, webinars coming up in the month of June on different topics, and so I would definitely ask you to keep your ear out for it. Um, and I also have one from Deborah. She wants to know, is there any legal financial assistance available for families regarding guardianship, legal, health care, proxy, et cetera? Right. Right. I know um, I appreciate that question, Deborah, because I know it costs, I mean, it, you know, to um, get guardianship done through the courts, which is the way you need to get it done, full guardianship, you know, it costs a lot of money. Um, as of now, off the top of my head, I don't know of any resource that could help with that. But um, I, you know, I definitely because I have not. I don't know of any because there are court fees that you have to pay. Um, so, you know, even if you have an attorney who does it pro bono, there are still court fees that are involved. Um, that I don't know how. I, I don't know off the top of my head what kind of support. Um, is available, financial support is available out there. Um, there might be, it's just that I may not be aware of it. Um, but if I do find something out, I will definitely, um, you know, definitely let you know, um, you know, if I find some supports out there. And Great I, question. Oh, wait, I do have one from Angel. Okay. She said, what okay. type of attorney do you need to obtain health care decisions or power of attorney or guardianship for a child right I um, I mean I think uh, we so at parent to parent we have a list of um, lawyers that we can send you um, you know and um, I don't I would I, I mean I would ask the question you know before I hire a lawyer I would ask them some questions and this is just me like I would ask them you know what what um, experience have you had with um, you know uh, um, guardianship or wills and even, you know, and this could be a good opportunity also to start, you know, having a will and having a special needs trust, which is a whole different ball game altogether. But also, you know, talking about those things, um, you know, I think asking your um, attorney questions would be important before you hire them. You know, what kind of experience they have, uh, because you want to make sure that um, whatever they're putting together is you know because especially like with the trusts and the wills and stuff like that I mean it has to be very specific language and you have to have an attorney who has knowledge about it um, there are some attorneys who um, you know who specialize in these kind of things and we can definitely send you a list of potential attorneys um, you know um, and definitely ask them questions of what the experience is you know how many of these have they done um, you know, have they worked with um, families who have children with special needs? Um, what is their background and experience? You know, 
um, because uh, you know some of the lawyers themselves have children with disabilities, and so they're very knowledgeable. Um, there are some lawyers who don't have children with disabilities, but yet that's the field they work in, so they're very knowledgeable. Um, but we can definitely send you a list of um, lawyers that you can look at um, who identify themselves as having, um, you know, I, I'm not endorsing one over the other, but um, these are um, lawyers who have identified themselves as having um, uh, experience with, um, you know, either guardianship or wills or trusts. Um, so we can definitely send that to you. So either call the 770 number that is up here, um, or um, you know you can just shoot me an email, and I can uh, definitely send you a list of lawyers. Okay. And Dora wants to say thank you so much for this presentation, and your information has been very helpful. And Tamika's question: How can I find resources that my daughter may qualify for when she is when she turns 22? and can no longer attend high school, should I contact you okay. by email for more information? Yes, and my answer to that, and uh, thank you, Dora, and uh, Tamika, yes, um, just call us. Um, you know, um, if you know, you can definitely send me an email. You can also call our office, and our um, we have um, coordinators here, and um, they are experts. I mean, they, this is what they talk to families every day. So, you know, definitely call us. And if you send me an email, I might, um, you know, forward you on to one of our coordinators, um, and who can definitely help you and walk you through the process and give you some options that might be available for you uh, and your daughter, um, so that this um, transition is. I mean, it's hard. I mean, you know, I get it. This is hard. Um, our kids are in school. You know, we have a nice protective environment that they're in. We're comfortable with the school, and now all of a sudden everything is changing. Um, and so this is a hard transition, and it's long, um, and it's ongoing. Um, so what I want to reach out to you to say is that that's, we're here. We're here to support you, help you navigate the system, and even connect you to other parents who have gone through this or are, you know, are maybe a couple steps beyond where you are at this point. And you can talk to them because you know, I strongly believe getting information from another parent uh, who's been there is, is critical, you know, is, is really helpful because they know the struggles that they've been through and they can share that so that you don't, you avoid those. Um, so yes, you know, um, we can definitely um, help you is the short answer to that. And I think, um, Geraldine, we're kind of out of time. It's yeah, one o'clock. And Tamika are, just says thank any, you so much. There... No, she didn't have any more questions. I don't have any more questions. Tamika just says thank you so much um, for the presentation okay. and your knowledge. Uh, excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, you know, um, please check in with us. We have a lot more webinars coming up on um, various topics uh, in the following month. In, you know, by end of June, we'll have a lot of webinars. So uh, stay tuned. And, um, and this is not the end of it. I just want you to know that um, we're here to support you and provide you with information and resources. So feel free to call us, email us. Um, you know, and if you have to call us 10 times, then so be it. So, all right. And thank you all. I really appreciate all of you taking your time out of this afternoon to listen to this presentation. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you uh, and providing you with information. Thanks. Thank you, Geraldine. No problem. And this concludes this webinar.